Holland. Thank you, Chair. And I'd like to thank my uh, friend from uh, Canterbury for securing this debate. Uh, she is a woman that I am very proud of. I know yeah, that yeah, many yeah, members yeah. are as well. Um, it's vital in debates like this that we celebrate not only the achievement of the 1928 Act, but remember the stories of the women and the fighters who campaigned for it, who won the battle for electoral reform, suffrage and equality. Now, 2018 marks 100 years since some women got the right to vote. Not all of them, but some of them, and it was a good step forward. But too often, people get confused between the different representation of the People's Acts. And if it weren't for the fantastic Voice and Vote exhibition over in Westminster Hall, it's easy for Members of Parliament to get confused between all of them as well. But when, what piece of legislation happened and what it meant. But in 1918, when some women were given the right to vote, it was only really for women at the top, the top of society that could get the right to vote. The 1928 Act gave the vote to all women over the age of 21, rather than those over 20 who were landowners, which was a huge step forward. It meant that 52.5% of the electorate in the 1929 general election were women. A transformative change from where it was only a few years before. The fact that it would take 10 years more, two whole parliaments to fully extend the franchise shows just how scared the establishment was of giving proper representation to women and the working class across the UK. Now I want to pay tribute to the incredible campaigners that continue to make the case for this act. Many gave up their freedom, faced imprisonment, went on hunger strikes. Many like Emily Davison gave their lives to the cause, but they never gave up. They're an inspiration to all of us in this house, and we pledge ourselves to further their cause. And it is a story that is often overlooked. In Plymouth, we're really proud to be part of the suffragette story. We're really proud that the suffragette movement that we had in Plymouth weren't just rich women campaigning for the vote. They were women that took actions into their own hands. Now, you may be familiar with the beautiful Smeaton's Tower, on Plymouth Hoe, the lighthouse that stands proudly. It still stands proudly, but the suffragettes tried to blow it up. They put a bomb in <laughs> Smeaton's Tower to try and blow it up because they wanted to attach attention to their cause. I'm glad the lighthouse still stands, but that story of how local women in Plymouth resorted to means to try and gain attention, the incredibility of their cause, is something we should continue to talk about. And there is one uh, person in particular, as the member of Parliament for Plymouth, Sutton and Devonport, that I wish to talk about now, and that is Nancy Astor. As my friend from Canterbury um, rightly made in her speech, um, the story about how we got to have only a third of our Parliament being women uh, started with Nancy Astor taking her seat in 1919. Now, she represented Plymouth, Sutton at the time, and she was introduced to the House of Commons by uh, flanked by Balfour on one side and Lloyd George on the other. Next year is the 100th anniversary of her election in November 1919, and it's the 100th anniversary of Plymouth voting for a woman. Now, myself and uh, Nancy Astor would disagree on nearly everything. <laughs> Fundamentally so. There are many, many things that she stood for that I simply could not stomach countenance or go along with, as I'm sure would be the case for nearly every single member in this House. Her views on slavery, anti-Semitism, fascism, LGBT equality is something that we would not share. But her story, the fact that she was the first woman to take her seat in this place, and the fact that Plymouth was the first place to elect a woman to take her seat, means that we are intimately entwined with this story, and it is a story that we must keep telling. Because at the moment, there are far too many girls and young women in our schools in Plymouth and across the country who do not know about Nancy Astor. Now, I do not want an advocacy of her political views. I want a story about how we had brave women who stood alone in many cases, doing brave things, really pushing the boundaries for women in general. And her role as the Member of Parliament for Women, as her initial title was when she got here, is something that we should be talking about. There should be a debate about the good size and bad size of all politicians, but that first step is really important. Now, it may seem very odd as a Labour MP to be standing here talking about a Conservative MP, especially one that I fundamentally disagree with, but we need to tell the story. Because what frustrates me so much is that the story of women in our politics is not told. We hear about the men. Occasionally you may hear about the woman standing behind the man, but you hear about the man, don't you? And that is something that we need to break. And we can only do that when we ourselves take that and start telling the story. And in particular, when men start telling the story as well. We can't leave it to only to women to tell the side of women in politics. It needs to be for all members of parliament, male or female, to talk up the role of women in parliament. On, on that point. Happy giving way. Uh, I, I thank my honourable friend uh, uh, for giving way. And he's making an excellent contribution. In terms of women pushing boundaries, 
uh, would he not agree with me that uh, so often women, especially from ethnic minorities, uh, are, are not given uh, as much credit uh, in terms of their accomplishments. For example, in Slough, uh, wherein we had the first ever black lady mayor in the entire country uh, elected, uh, Lydia Simmons, who was an inspiration for so many, uh, and yet uh, so often those individuals don't get the credit that they so rightly deserve. Well, I thank my friend for that intervention. I think he, he proved it precisely that we need male MPs to be talking up as well as female MPs as well. So thank you for taking advice so quickly in terms of doing this. <laughs> now, I uh, recently went to the superb uh, voice and vote exhibition in Westminster Hall, to which I want to pay tribute to the House authorities for putting on. It really is a superb mm -hmm. exhibition, and members who haven't visited really need to spend the time in their day doing that. You'll notice when you go in there, there's Nancy Astor's dress. It's on loan from Plymouth Museum, and she picked that dress to look like a man's suit. So it looks like a double-breasted suit. And on the side, there's a little, play, a little plaque that talks about why she chose that. And she said, I wanted people to listen to my words and not what I wore. So it's somewhat ironic that 99 years later, I stand here as one of her successors talking about her dress and disagreeing with all her words. But actually, that is the, the joys of democracy, perhaps. But when she started, Parliament was a very different place. The story that Vote and Voice tells us is about a system that did not welcome women to Parliament, did not give them, afford them the equality and credibility that they deserve by, mer by merit of their own election. You can see that by the fact that there was only one coat hook in the lady members' room in 1929 for eight female MPs. Simply unacceptable. But there's still far too much that we need to address that those women at the time, Nancy Astor included, were fighting for and that we are still fighting for today. Now, Nancy Astor was a woman who was not afraid to stand up for herself. As a woman, even in the face of power, she had an incredibly canny sense of humour, and those people who have spent time in Plymouth will know of many stories uh, about her. I just want to briefly touch on two, and in particular, I want to touch on her relationship with Winston Churchill, because uh, many members will know one story about it, but there are so many glorious clashes between Nancy Astor and Winston Churchill. Churchill once apparently told Nancy Astor that having a woman in Parliament is like having one intrude on him in the bathroom, to which she retorted, you're not handsome enough to have such fears. <laughs> Lady Astor is also have responded to a question from Churchill about what disguise he should wear to a masquerade ball, and she said, why don't you come sober, Prime Minister? But perhaps the most famous exchange, which I'm sure all members will know about Churchill, is one where Mr. Churchill said, Mr. Churchill, if you were my husband, I would poison your tea. So uh, she said, to which Churchill replied, Madam, if, I were, if you were my wife, I would drink it. <laughs> there is so many stories about Nancy Astor that are told, but there are so few stories told about many of the other fantastic female MPs for Plymouth. In particular, I want to single out Lucy Middleton, who was the MP from 1945 to 51, a real tower of strength in the trade union movement. She is not remembered enough by my own party in Plymouth, nor is she remembered enough by all of us here. Sadly, she lost her seat to another member, male member of the Astor dynasty, Jack, Jackie Astor, in 1951. But it is good to see her name on the wall of female MPs in the Vote and Voice exhibition, because there's so much more that needs to be done there. Just very, very briefly, uh, Ms Buck, one thing that frustrates me every time I come to Parliament, every time I am in here, and it is something that helps keep the fire alive in me so I don't become accustomed or cushioned by this place, is to look around the rooms in which we have our meetings and to look at all the old white men in wigs staring down at me. Because this place here has a problem in the fact that nearly every single room, perhaps except the one that we're in at the moment, has too many pictures of men, too many pictures of old men, too many pictures of old white rich men on the walls. Where are the women? Every single one of these rooms should have 50-50 representation. If there are not the paintings of the women from our political history, commission them, loan them, borrow them, put them up there, take down those images of old white men, and let's have it so when young children from Plymouth come to visit Parliament, they can see pictures of people like them. Let's make sure that it's not just male and female representation. Let's make sure that we have LGBT heroes on our walls, that we have BAME heroes on our walls, and disabled heroes on our walls. Because at the moment, this place looks far too often like the old, stale, white male club that it sometimes was in the past. We can change that, 
We need to do it by talking up about equality, talking about the need that we continue to be restless about it, to make sure that we keep fighting the misogyny that we see in our politics, in our parties, in our society, giving voice to the single parents, the WASPy women, those people who are standing up for equality, wanting a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. That is what all of us need to do. But we can all do our bits to make sure that we're there by telling the story of women in politics. And the 1928 Act is a really important part that we say. Mm -hmm. I look forward to my honourable friend from Canterbury still being here in 10 years to lead this debate about the 100th anniversary of Absolutely. that Act as well. Thank you. Yeah. Well done.